Today, we aim to delve into the most mysterious airplane hijacking in world history in this video. I'm sure you've wondered why all airplane hijackers are often referred to as D.B. Cooper. In this video, we'll answer all your questions, so stay with us and we hope you enjoy it. Our world is filled with mysterious events and enigmatic stories that leave us questioning. In this channel, we aim to delve into historical facts from around the world, shedding light on their intriguing mysteries. We are Time Spectators. The most enigmatic unsolved incident in aviation history occurred in 1971 in the United States, and the identity of the main character in this story remains a mystery to this day. On November 24, 1971, a man identifying himself as Dan Cooper purchased a one-way ticket from Portland to Seattle with Pacific Northwest Airlines. Flight 305 was scheduled to reach its destination in a 35-minute flight and one-third of the plane's seats were occupied. After boarding the plane, Cooper took seat 18C, lit a cigarette and calmly ordered a drink from the flight attendant, paying for it without any fuss. The Boeing 727 took off at 2.50 p.m., but shortly after takeoff, events began to unfold. Cooper called over a flight attendant and handed her a note. Florence Schaffner, the flight attendant, initially ignored the note, thinking it was something a passenger had dropped and Cooper had found. As she was about to walk away, Cooper grabbed her hand and quietly said, Miss, you'd better read that note. I have a bomb. He then asked her to sit beside him. Terrified, Florence complied and sat next to him. Cooper opened his briefcase to show her the bomb, confirming her worst fears. Florence agreed to comply with all his demands. Cooper told her that all his demands were written in the note. His demands included a bag containing $200,000 in $20 bills and four parachutes. The flight attendant quickly relayed the situation to the pilot, William Scott, who immediately informed Seattle's air traffic control. The passengers were told that a minor technical issue would delay the flight. William Scott first spoke with the FBI director and then with Donald Naira the then president of the Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, explaining the situation. Both conversations concluded with the decision to meet all of Cooper's demands. Naira promised to quickly arrange the money and parachutes and instructed the flight crew to comply with all of Cooper's instructions. The plane circled over Puget Sound for two hours to allow time for these arrangements. During this time, the flight crew realized that Cooper had extensive knowledge of the area. When flying over Tacoma, Cooper mentioned that they were 20 minutes away from the nearest airport and kept track of the negotiation's progress. It became clear to the crew that Cooper had a well-thought-out and precise plan for the hijacking. The FBI managed to secure $200,000 in $20 bills with a specific serial numbers from a Seattle bank. All the bills had serial numbers starting with the letter L and were printed in 1963. Additionally, four parachutes were obtained from a flight school in Seattle. With all of Cooper's demands met, the plane finally landed at 5.24 p.m. To avoid being targeted by snipers, Cooper instructed the flight attendants to lower all the window shades. The chief airport official in Seattle handed over the bag of money and the four parachutes to Tina Makalo, the flight attendant in charge of the cabin. Tina immediately brought the items to Cooper and handed them over. After receiving his demands, Cooper allowed the flight attendants, Schaffner and Alice Hancock, to leave the plane. This left only five people on board, two pilots, a flight engineer, the cabin attendant and Cooper. During the refueling process, Cooper came to the cockpit and instructed the pilots to fly to Mexico City at an altitude of 10,000 feet and a speed of 100 knots. The pilots informed him that this was impossible and that they could only fly at an altitude of 1,000 feet as they would need to refuel at another airport before reaching Mexico. Cooper and the pilots had a heated discussion about the flight plan and eventually agreed to refuel at an airport in Nevada. The plane took off again at 7.40 p.m. with Cooper and the four crew members on board. Immediately, two F-106 fighter jets took off to follow the plane, one flying above the Boeing 727 and the other below. Shortly after, three more fighter jets joined making a total of five F-106s tracking the hijacked plane. Cooper soon noticed the presence of the fighter jets and threatened to detonate the bomb if they didn't leave. The US government had no choice but to comply with Cooper's demands and ordered the jets to back off and leave the area. Cooper then gathered all the crew members in the cockpit and locked the door. About 20 minutes into the flight, the pilots and crew heard noises from inside the plane. 
indicating that Cooper was preparing to do something. At 8.13 p.m., a sudden change in cabin pressure triggered the plane's warning systems. The pilot attempted to communicate with Cooper, but he refused. Two minutes later, the sudden pressure change indicated that Cooper had opened the rear door of the plane, causing the tail and rear of the aircraft to lift and change angle. The pilots had to manually control the plane under very difficult and dangerous conditions for two hours until they landed at Reno Airport in Nevada. Upon landing and exiting the cockpit, the crew discovered that Cooper was no longer on the plane. Cooper had escaped with a bag full of cash equivalent to about $1.2 million in today's money. Subsequent FBI investigations found only two of the parachutes Cooper had requested inside the plane. The police and FBI initially interrogated everyone who had spoken with Cooper on the plane and expanded their investigation to uncover Dan Cooper's identity. The police were certain that Cooper had jumped from the plane at 8.13 p.m. Experts believe he had jumped over the Lewis River, but a severe storm was occurring in the area at that time. Under normal conditions, Cooper's chances of survival after jumping in such weather were nearly zero. The possible landing area for Cooper was a lake called Merwin. The entire region, including the lake, river, forest, mountains, farms, and neighboring states was thoroughly searched on foot and by helicopter for any trace of Cooper, but no evidence or footprints were found. Later, the police used a stimulation system to reconstruct the events of that day, but the change in the plane's speed when the rear door opened made it difficult to pinpoint Cooper's landing area. Ultimately, the combination of the plane's speed change, the severe storm, and the darkness of night made it impossible for the police to determine the exact time and location of Cooper's jump and landing. A few days later, the FBI found records of a man named Dan Cooper in Oregon, but it turned out he had no connection to the hijacking. The FBI then distributed the serial numbers of the bills Cooper had taken to all casinos, financial institutions, and economic centers across the country. They also published a notice in all national newspapers offering a $1,000 reward for credible information about Dan Cooper. However, this approach also yielded no results except for $5,800 found by a child near the Lewis River. No further trace of Cooper or the money has been found to this day and the police's findings in this case did not go beyond that $5,800. In a press conference about the hijacking, a mispronunciation of D.B. Cooper instead of Dan Cooper led to the mysterious hijacker being known as D.B. Cooper in the media, a name that has persisted to this day. Since that day, all airplane hijackers around the world have been colloquially referred to as D.B. Cooper. Cooper, a 40-year-old man standing 180 centimeters tall, dressed in a black suit and wearing sunglasses, became a part of history. According to the flight crew, Cooper was a very polite and courteous individual, bearing no resemblance to typical hijackers. Tina Mucklow, the cabin attendant, mentioned that Cooper remained incredibly calm throughout the incident and did not mistreat them in any way. Following the incident and D.B. Cooper's jump from the plane, a system was installed on aircraft to ensure that the doors could not be opened during flight. This new design was named the Cooper Vane after him. After this mysterious event, Cooper became a legendary hero for many Americans. Four books were published about him, several films were made, and dozens of television programs were produced, all exploring the enigma of D.B. Cooper. Well, that's it for today's episode of Time Spectators. I hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. And don't forget to share your thoughts and opinions in the comment section below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. All content featured in this video is original and owned by Time Spectators. Time Spectators Narrator Copyright